Okay. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that we're doing here in Oxford, um, actually here in the John Radcliffe. Um, we're trying to find some of the earliest um, signs of frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia is a group of progressive and overlapping clinical syndromes that are associated with atrophy, so that's brain shrinking, in the frontal and temporal lobes. So the images you can see there where you've got these increased dark areas are where the brain's sort of shrinking in the frontal and the temporal regions. Um, so Robin gave a nice introduction to dementia and the overall um, prevalence of it. Um, it's not as common a dementia as Alzheimer's disease, but in fact in um, the younger age group, so 45 to 65, it's the second most common um, dementia next to Alzheimer's disease and is actually nearly almost as common. So it's considered a young onset dementia. Um, so we know the broad, oh, sorry about this, um, okay, so we know the sort of broad functions of the frontal lobes, the frontal and the temporal lobes are affected um, in frontotemporal dementia, hence the name. Um, the frontal lobes you can see there shown in blue, um, the broad functions of them are very much associated with behaviour, motivation, impulse control and some important speech and emotion functions. And because of this, we can sort of predict the kind of symptoms we'll see in FTD um, because of the functions of the frontal lobe. So when the frontal lobe starts to atrophy, we have symptoms associated with those functions. The temporal lobes, um, that they're shown in the yellow and pink, um, are very important. They have very important memory and language functions. So again, these are things that are affected in um, frontotemporal dementia. So because of the functions of those lobes, we have um, some symptoms that we see in patients. Um, one of the most, the clearest uh, symptoms is a lack of insight. So um, patients often don't know that anything is wrong or that they've had any change in behavior. And it's very often family members who report um, changes. So hyperorality is another one. So that's a kind of fixation with the mouth and um, sort of seeking out sweet things and kind of compulsive eating. Um, lack of hygiene um, can be a problem, so um, patients sometimes become quite apathetic and stop um, caring for themselves. Um, there's also quite a few behavioural changes um, that can, can occur, and this again is because of the, the functions of the frontal lobes that are affected. So impulsivity, some compulsive behaviours, Apathy, um, which can be quite difficult in families when people start to become quite apathetic towards um, their loved ones. Um, also disinhibition. Um, and these are the, really the behavioural um, variants of, of uh, frontotemporal dementia. Um, there's also a language variant in which um, there can be problems with uh, speech, with production and comprehension of speech, um, with being able to name simple things. Um, and there's a picture of Terry Jones, who has a primary progressive aphasia, which is a, a type of um, variant of frontotemporal dementia that's associated with problems with um, producing speech. So I'm going to um, share with you just two case studies um, from some patients from my clinic um, who've kindly let us share their stories. Um, they've sort of been anonymized for this purpose. Um, and just to give you a sort of sense of how we can have very different presentations of this type of dementia. Um, so Elaine was a 59-year-old healthcare assistant, and she reported um, progressive difficulty finding words when she was speaking. She noticed this particularly on the telephone and at work, where she was having problems pronouncing longer words, such as drug names. At interview, her speech was effortful and distorted, and she'd say things like selizant instead of elephant, and um, she could name a shirt, but she'd call the cuff a slough. Um, she had has trouble repeating words such as British Constitution and baby hippopotamus. And she also had, um, that's quite difficult actually, to be fair. Um, she also had trouble um, following multi-stage commands. So if you ask her to pick up a pencil and put it underneath a sheet of paper, she'd have trouble with both stages of that command. Um, and her uh, family history was interesting because her mother um, actually had frontotemporal dementia. Um, so John, a uh, 51-year-old property lawyer, 
Um, he began to steal money at work and regularly listed mysterious expenses on his travel at reimbursement forms. That turned out to be the purchases of pornographic materials by the internet. When questioned, he claimed that he used his corporate account so that his wife would not find out about his sexual activity. At the time that this was discovered, there had also been some complaints of sexual harassment from female colleagues, um, and he eventually lost his job, but he didn't bother to try to find another one. He became increasingly apathetic at home, and his wife and children said that over the year, he just completely lost interest and stopped speaking to them. He also developed a strong desire for potato crisps and um, gained 15 pounds. Um, interestingly, his family history revealed that his father and his first cousin had both died of motor neuron disease. Um, so in both those cases, you can, um, you can see very different profiles that are presented of, of frontotemporal dementia, but also, interestingly, both had a family history. Um, and that's because um, that's important because we know around 30 to 40 percent of patients have a relevant family history. And that's because we know that there are mutations in um, three genes that account for the majority of these, these familial cases. So um, that's not to say that anybody who has FTD will pass it down to their family members because, in fact, still the majority of cases are what we call sporadic, so they don't, they're not necessarily related to a family history or any specific genes that we know of. But um, these patients are quite important to our research because, because these families have this inherited form of the disease. We can study family members who um, have the gene mutation but haven't yet developed the disease themselves. And that can help us to find really early stages before we have um, symptoms presented. So here in Oxford, we're part of GenFi, um, which is the Genetic Frontotemporal Dementia Initiative. And this is a multi-center longitudinal study of FTD that was started in 2012. It includes 25 research centers across Europe and Canada, and we have around 600 participants already um, recruited. So we're bringing in patients and their family members who have these gene mutations. And we do some brain imaging, um, a lot of behavioral testing, and um, we take some biological markers. So just to give you a sort of idea of the design of the study, so we have our FTD, frontotemporal dementia patient, um, and they've already been uh, tested, and we know that they carry this gene mutation. Um, so their first degree relatives then also have um, a chance of also carrying this mutation that's been passed on. Um, so their siblings and their children. Um, they might, these d relatives might be a mutation carrier or they might not. Um, in either case, we bring them in to do some studying. If they're not carrying the, the mutation, then they act as our sort of healthy control um, and they, they're not likely to go on to get FTD. If they are a mutation carrier, they're usually many, many years before any symptoms onset. So we can study them longitudinally to see if we can find really any tiny early signs of things changing in their behavior in their brain. So we're interested in um, any changes that are early on, so before the disease onsets. So the way that we kind of try to predict when their disease will onset is by um, taking the average age of onset within the family. And then we look at how many years before that age that the, this family member is. So, for example, if a mother develops um, FTD at age 50 and she has a son who carries the gene mutation who's currently 30, then we estimate that the son is around 20 years before the estimated age of onset of his FTD. Now, that's not to say that if somebody has FTD at 50 that their, their children will get it at that same age. Um, this is just our best sort of estimate at the moment until we get a better understanding of when the disease onsets. So we bring in our patients and our family members um, at a baseline point, and then we see them again after a year, and then again after two years, and hopefully um, if we get funding again through until five years, because we really want to track them over a long period of time to see um, if the disease is starting and how it's progressing. Um, we take medical history, um, we do physical exams, we do very comprehensive neuropsychological testing, 
and also um, tests, uh, computerized um, tests of um, other functions. Um, and we, we take blood samples and uh, lumbar punctures and do some um, brain imaging as well. Um, importantly, we don't um, disclose the genetic results to, our, to the family members. They don't have to know. They don't ever have to know. Um, some of them don't ever want to know. Um, we don't know the results either. So it's all held completely blindly so that we've got no bias. So when we do this, we see that around five years before symptom onset, so this is in our family members who are otherwise healthy, but they have this mutation um, that gives them a risk of developing, it, developing FTD. We see um, some subtle changes in behavior, some short-term memory, attention, executive function, and language changes. And this is five years before we see any symptoms at all. And in fact, in the brain imaging, 10 years before our expected symptom onset, we can see um, shrinking in an area of the brain called the insula that's highlighted there in red, and also in the temporal lobes. And then five years before symptom onset, we start to see shrinking in the green area there, the frontal lobe. So that front, those temp frontal temporal areas that are most affected in this dementia. And then we compare that to 10 years after symptom onset. So once someone has had FTD for, for 10 years, we can see there's a lot of atrophy all over the brain there. So the important part of this is that um, at the stage at which the atrophy has, has spread um, more widely, it's a lot harder to treat um, because there's, a, there's been a lot of ir irreversible damage already. So if we, if we can get in a lot earlier, then we might have more effective drug treatments to kind of either stop or delay the progression of the disease. Um, so what are we hoping to find? Well, we really want to find early and robust markers of FTD onset. So when people come into the clinic reporting symptoms, it's often been many, many years of changes in the brain that have gone on undetected. And we really want to find those changes as early as possible so that we can stop the progression or at least delay it. Um, we also want to find robust markers of disease progression. So each case is very different, and it's very hard to give people an accurate idea of what's going to happen in the future because we don't really know exactly how the disease progress progresses. We also want to find the times for, in for treatment intervention. So as I said before, and as other people have, has, have alluded to, um, getting in earlier is really the important um, thing to do to, before any irreversible damage has occurred. And then we also want to find some outcome measures for clinical trials. So when we're developing new drugs, how do we know that they're effective? How do we know that they're working? Is it because they've helped some of the symptoms or is it because they've stopped some of that brain shrinkage, that brain atrophy? So um, if you have any questions, um, then please do come and see me or uh, feel free to email us at memory at ndcn.ox.ac.uk. Thank you.